So this morning, Professor Jay Rosengas has talked about fiscal decentralization, in which he talked about the general frameworks, the political aspect of fiscal decentralization. So in the first session of this afternoon, I am going to apply that framework to two case studies. One is China and the other is Vietnam. And during my presentation, if you have any question, please just raise your hand, stop me, and we will discuss. All right, so uh, I'm going to remind you a little bit about different dimensions of fiscal decentralization. So when we talk about fiscal decentralization, basically we talk about three essential aspects. One is revenue, the other is expenditure, and the third is how the intergovernmental fiscal relationship can uh, be facilitated, facilitated. Accordingly, the degree of decentralization can be measured by the ratio of local government's revenues, local government expenditures, and the transfer among the two different levels of government. So now using that framework, we are going to look at China and then Vietnam in their process of fiscal decentralization starting from the uh, 70s until today. So let's start with China. In my presentation, you will see there are two aspects, two factors, which are crucially, critically important. One is politics, the other is incentives. And during my presentation, I would encourage you to relate what I am talking to what's happening in Myanmar nowadays and to in your region and state. Any discussion of fiscal decentralization should start with the structure of the government so that we know each and every levels of government in the nation. And if you look at the slide, the government in China is divided into two levels. One is the central or national levels, the other is local or sub-national level. And for the sub-national or local level, it can be further divided into four levels. The first is provincial level, that consists of 33 provinces or equivalent level of government. So in addition to 22 provinces, China also has autonomous region, for example, the Qinkang, the Tibet, or Inner Mongolia, for example. China also has four special metropolitan uh, cities, including Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, and uh, Chongqing. And they have two special districts, which are used to be the colonies of the, the England, Great Britain, and the Portugal. And then below that, you have 333 prefectures, you know, thousands of townships, and uh, county levels as well. In my discussion, I will focus mostly on the first two levels, namely the national and sub-national levels. I'm focusing mostly on the provincial uh, provinces and autonomous region and so on. An additional note is if you read Chinese history, China was unified at a country since Teng Xinhuang, which is in the second uh, century before uh, BC. And ever since, China has always tried to be a strong central government. China, China has to, you know, China has to maintain a strong control of the central level in order for the country to function well. Because in the history of China, there has always been the tendency for regions to break apart, to get rid of the control of the central government. And if you observe recent development in China today, you still see that trend. You still see that Xi Jinping is trying very hard to put everything under his control. So I'm going to talk about the first phase of fiscal decentralization in China, which is from 1949, 
when the country was created until 1979 when Deng Xiaoping decided to start to reform. And if you look at China at that time, China wanted to maintain a central planning economy. The revenues, the budget revenues relies mostly on state-owned enterprises. At that time, there was virtually no private sector in China except for households and small businesses. So in terms of the revenue, all or most of the revenues comes from the public sectors. In terms of tax administration, the local governments act as an agent for the central government in collecting taxes. And the fiscal system is consolidated so that even expenditure in the local government need to seek approval from the higher level. And this, in this kind of fiscal system, the transfer is so important because whoever will not be able to fill the gap between the revenue and expenditure will, be tr will receive transfer from the central government. So let's suppose that you put yourself into that situation and see what are the incentives for the local governments and for the central governments when it comes to revenue, expenditure, and transfer. Do you think the local governments will have incentive to collect more taxes? What do you think? Below, below 10. Uh, even though it's a central government that uh, instructs uh, local government to collect the re uh, actual revenue, yeah. but local government did not collect actual because of the, just like a pocket money or the, like a corruption. That's why it's uh, not equal between the local government and then the uh, central government That's right. needs. Yeah. Yes. Any other ideas? Think about the situation in which you are a rich province in China, right? like Shanghai or Shantung or some provinces along the coast. If you are rich, do you want to send all the collected money to the central government? What do you think? Yes or no? Yes or no? No, right? No. Because otherwise, you don't have enough. You, you want to hide some revenues so that you can use for your own purposes. And if you are a poor province, do you want to try very hard to collect taxes? Yes or no? No, right? Because you know that wherever the gap between the revenue and expenditure, the central government will transfer, will make the transfer to fill the gap. So the bottom line is that this system is not a good system because it doesn't provide sufficient incentives for both the rich and the poor provinces in collecting taxes. And that is exactly for this reason the central government in China wanted to, to reform the fiscal system in China. And in order to understand those tax reform measures, we need to understand the political and economic context of that period of time. Remember, Deng Xiaoping tried to reform the countries toward a market economy or market-oriented economies starting from 1978. It follows that many state-owned enterprises are reformed and no longer be the tax base for the government. No longer be the tax base, tax base yeah. of the government. Mm. In addition to that, now private firms start growing and exert pressure of competition to state-owned enterprises. And we all know that the state-owned enterprises in China before 78 was very inefficient, but they still created profits because of the fixed price system. But after 78, the fixed price system was no longer the main, the major coordination mechanism, and therefore SOEs didn't have, didn't uh, create uh, as much as profits as earlier. So the bottom line is the main tax base of the governments, which is the SOEs now dissolving and losing competition and losing profit. 
So this clearly creates a huge problem for the government in terms of tax revenue. That's why this is the three periods, the sub-periods during the 1970, I'm sorry, during 1979 and 1983, in which the central government started to experiment with different tax reforms. The main objective of fiscal reform is twofold. One, to facilitate the autonomy and responsibility of the local governments so that they can grow and develop. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, first, the first one is the local? The local governments to uh, have more autonomy and responsibility for development. But at the same time, the central governments wanted to do it in such a way to maintain or even strengthen the control of the central government. As I said earlier, there has always been the mentality for the central government in China to control. So starting from 1980, China started the so-called uniform fiscal revenue sharing system in which about 80% of the total revenue will be recruited to the central government and local government can keep only 20% of the total revenue. And there was a saying that the central government and the provincial government will, would eat in two separate kitchens. Now there are two kitchens, not one kitchen. What would be the incentives for you in terms of the fiscal revenue and expenditure? Revenue and expenditure should down ma. So, for example, like if her state, her local government is in the place of natural resource rich uh, place, and in that, in that case, she doesn't, she doesn't want to share 80% of her revenue to the center. She only wants to share only 50%. So, yeah. So, that's one impact. Another impact is, you know, think about the difference between rich and poor provinces. Rich provinces will have a lot to share and they don't want to share. Poor provinces don't have anything to share. So 80% is nothing, right? Because they don't have anything. So the bottom line is this system doesn't create the kind of incentives that we want. The rich provinces don't want to contribute more and the poor provinces still wait for the transfer from the central government. And at the same time, it's created the disparity among provinces in China. And that disparity encouraged the central government to move to another reform, which is not providing uniform fiscal revenue sharing, but now varies the revenue sharing in different provinces. So if you are a rich province, you are supposed to share more. And if you are a poorer province, you are supposed to share less. But again, this system created the reverse incentives. The richer province never want to share more. And the poorer province, even though they can keep more, they don't have much to keep. Now, instead of determining the sharing ratio, they put a fixed target. Okay, if you are Shanghai, this year you have to pay this, you have to contribute this much tax to the central government. Hello. This is called the fiscal contracting system. The problem of this system is how to determine the targets. And at the end, the targets will, de will determine through a series, you know, a long process of negotiation and renegotiation. So if you are a powerful province, for example, Shanghai, there's a lot of leadership who are from, coming from the province, now the top leaders in the national government, then you have a lot of lev leverage to negotiate. So at the end, this fiscal system is quite discretionary and subject to a lot of political influence and negotiation. Because sometimes political influence, for example, Shanghai is very powerful, but mm. the rest, uh, you know, a poor state yeah. has less power. So right. Shanghai, well, whether they will negotiate with the central and also the other uh, government as well. I would like to know this one. Yeah. Thank you. This is a very good question. The idea is if the target or the sharing are subject to negotiation, 
then provinces with a lot of political power will have a leverage in negotiation and they get a better deal compared to other provinces. And the problem of that is the erosion of the tax for both the central government and the local government. Sure. So let's look at the data. If you look at this, starting from 84, the ratio, this, is the, the, this line is the ratio of central government revenue in total budget, and it went down sharply from about 42% to about 23, 24% in, in 1993. And at the same time, if you look at the ratio of total government revenues to GDP, it went down sharply from nearly 30% to a little bit more than 10%. And if you are the central government in China, you will never like this situation because the total revenues in terms of GDP has declined and the, to the share of the central government in that revenue also declined. And that's why China decided to make another wave of reform in 1994. So what are the objectives of that reform? So the first one is they try to reverse the decline of total tax revenue as percentage of GDP and the share of the central government in that tax revenue. And another element, very important element, is they try to simplify tax structure by reducing tax type and tax rates. And one of the most important tax reform in China, as well as in Vietnam, as you see later, is VAT tax, value added tax. And in the 1990s, value added tax contributed about 42% of the total tax revenue for China. And China unified the VAT tax and had a unified rate of 17%, 17 percent of the VAT tax applied to own uh, firms and, uh, and, and products. Another important element of fiscal reform in this period is it creates the tax sharing system which is much more transparent and varying compared to the previous one. The national tax service was established so that the central government will establish the national tax service office in provinces to collect both the national tax and the share tax revenue. So remember, in the past, the local government would collect tax on behalf of the central government and then send, send the tax revenue to the central government. Now the central government established the tax office in the provinces to collect tax by themselves and for themselves. Now let's look at the taxes. The there are three groups of taxes. One is the central taxes, including like tariff and consumption tax. And for this group, the central government will keep 100%. And the second group is local taxes, including like resource tax, urban land tax, and uh, urban land using taxes, and so on and so forth. And for taxes in this group, the central, the local government will keep 100%. And the third one is share taxes, including VAT, business taxes, you know, profession, uh, personal income tax, and corporate income tax. And if you look at the tax sharing ratio, they are different among different taxes. For example, for the VAT tax, the central government will keep 75% and 25% is kept by the local government. And for business tax, 97% will be kept by local governments and only 3% is kept by the central government. For the two income taxes, including personal income tax and corporate income tax, initially they divide 50%, 50%. But after that, the central government want to increase the ratio that it can keep. So 60% is kept by the central government and 40% is kept by the local government. An important aspect of this kind of tax sharing system is the local government will rely mostly on the share taxes. And this is quite a smart tax sharing system because 
if you are a local government, you want to increase tax revenue, you need to increase the share revenues. And by increasing or improving your own tax revenue, you will improve the tax revenue going to the central government as well. And if you look at the results, it's immediate and astonishing. Immediate and? Immediate and astonishing. The two ratios reversed their trends right in 1994. So in 1993, central government's share of the total revenue is only about 22%. In 1994, it went up to nearly 60%. And then it stayed relatively high, more than 50% ever since. And at the same time, the total tax revenue as percentage of GDP has already, has also increased. And you should remember, keep in mind that this is the period in which the GDP growth in China is more than 10%. So the improvement of the tax revenues is so big in this period. This is clearly one of the most important reforms in China since 1978. I'm going, uh, I'm going to quickly overview the expenditure assignment, which is quite consistent with international practice. So the national government is responsible for like defense, for diplomacies, for paying national debt. And the central and local government share the expenditures in terms of education, healthcare, construction, infrastructure, and so on. In terms of government transfer, about 40% is tax rebate. This is very important and special for China. As I said earlier, China wanted to reconcentrate the tax collection. And only after they collected the tax, then they will return it to the local government. The excess amount that local government has paid. In that way, the central government in China control tightly the tax collection of the local government. Okay, to summarize, as I said earlier, incentives play a key role in designing and implementing fiscal decentralization policies. So between 1979 and 1993, China experienced the fiscal power devolution and contracting system. Created by that system is that the local government will have incentives to work and to promote the development of the private enterprises to expand the tax base. Then they can collect more tax and facilitate economic development. But at the same time, the negative consequences are, first, that there are disparity between rich and poor provinces. And two, the negotiation, political negotiation, is a common element in you know, deciding which province will get what. And the tax reform in 1994 features fiscal power recentralization together with tax sharing. And this helped the central governments in China to strengthen the fiscal power. A good thing about this fiscal system is that the sharing system is quite stable and transparent. But the best incentives is that the local government, especially for poorer provinces now, are relying much more dependent, much more on the transfer of the central government. And actually, Vietnam is experiencing this problem right now. Okay, so let me now turn to Vietnam. So in Vietnam, we have two levels of government, the central and local government. And the local government has three layers, the provincial, the district, and, I'm sorry, and the commune. So the system of government is quite similar to China, except for the fact that for the sub-national level, we have only three levels instead of four. And for the tax sharing, we have three groups. One is 100% central government. So the first group includes like trade taxes, VAT and excise tax on imports, the taxes and other revenue from petroleum, which is a natural resource, and the corporate income tax on the central enterprises, basically the very big state-owned enterprises. In terms of the taxes that can be kept 100% by the local government, the list is quite similar to that of China. 
And then for the share revenues, the most important are VAT and corporate income taxes. And in terms of expenditure, again, the expenditure assignment in Vietnam is quite similar to China and consistent to the international practice. If we want to discuss more, we can go back. But uh, because of uh, conscious, being conscious of time, I move to the next one, which is talking about the local revenue expenditure and central transfer in Vietnam. So the blue line is local government revenue as percentage of total revenue, and it has been increasing in the last 15 years or so. And at the same time, the local share in total expenditure has also been increasing. And the transfer was decreased in the early 2000s and stayed relatively stable ever since. So this situation is quite similar in, to China in the early 90s. Vietnam has never been able to maintain a high ratio of the central government revenues. And probably Vietnam will need a reform similar to the fiscal reform in China in 94. But I would like to focus on one very important element of this system, which is the incentives. So for example, in Vietnam nowadays, the rich provinces are supposed to send a higher ratio of, tax, of shared tax revenue to the central government. For example, Ho Chi Minh City, where our Fulbright University is located. In the early 2000s, Ho Chi Minh City was able to keep 29% of the total revenue, then it went down to 26% and more, and starting from 2017, it went down to 18%. If you are the governor, if you were the governor of Ho Chi Minh City, what would you do? Do you want to work hard? Do you want to encourage your uh, companies to produce more profits so that you can send more money to the central government? And think about poorer provinces who will receive subsidies from the central government by the money contributed by rich provinces like Ho Chi Minh City. So again, the issue is incentives. If Ho Chi Minh City has to pay the tax, let's put it that way, up 82%, to the center, then Ho Chi Minh City doesn't have incentive to produce more tax. And if you have a poorer province, you want to inflate your expenditure so that you can spend more and at the same time receive more transfer from the central government. And that is exactly what happened in Vietnam. So this slide is about the budget overrun in Vietnam in the last decades. So this is the comparison between the estimated expenditure and the real expenditure. And for provinces, the budget overrun is about 15 to 60%. For the central government, the budget overrun is in the range between 20 to 30%. Think about the situation in which everybody tries to spend more. So who will collect the taxes to finance those, you know, increasing expenditures. So in conclusion, when you designed the fiscal decentralization, you need to think carefully about the politics and about the incentives. And most of the time, these two go together. You cannot separate the two. There's also another aspect, another dimension of decentralization, which is the foreign direct investment decentralization. If you are interested in that topic, I can talk about it too. But uh, let's focus on this one, and if you have questions, I would be happy to answer. Because I'm aware that uh, there's a group from Mandalay, and someone from Mandalay is very interested in the topic of fiscal of uh, FDI decentralization. Do All right, so let's open up for question and discussion. Okay, so the question is, why Vietnam experience that high budget overrun? Right. So again, think back about the incentives facing provinces in Vietnam. Every province in Vietnam knows that if they have a fiscal gap, there will be transfer from the central government to the local government to fill the gap. 
for rich provinces in Vietnam, if you don't spend a lot, then you have to send more money to the central government. So you need to set, spend a lot. Okay. You want to spend as much as you can. For poorer provinces, you know that anyway, you will be subsidized by the central government through transfer. So again, you want to spend as much as you can. And as a result, the estimated budget is always be overrun. And even more, if you overrun your budget this year, then next year you can ask for more budget. And of course, this is subject to negotiation. You never get everything you ask for, but this is subject to negotiation. And if you have political leverage, then you can get more. Another negative consequence that I have to mention because it's very important. If you've ever been to Ho Chi Minh City, you can see that the traffic is crowded. There's a lot of traffic jams, the pollution issues, the drainage issue, and so on and so forth. But the Ho Chi Minh City had to send 82% of their revenues to the central government, and they don't have sufficient resources for infrastructure, for education, for other public services. So the current fiscal sharing system in Vietnam is extracting resources from well-performing provinces in order to cross-subsidize for, for, for poorer provinces at the cost of the development of the whole countries. So I never advise you to adopt this kind of fiscal decentralization in Vietnam, but learn from its mistakes. เออดาตุตุตุนายงามาเวียดนามมาရှိแกได้ကျွန်တော်တို့ဒီအတွေ့အကြုံကိုသူမျှဝေပြတာပေါ့เนาะအဲ့တော့သူ့အနေနဲ
those uh, uh, British equipment can get also the just advantage from the uh, good collection. But on the other hand, poor province also wait to get the uh, transfer from the central government. I think in the long run, it's not so good between the poor and the rich mm -hmm. yeah. the province. That's right. But uh, like, like that, also the now is so the uh, monthly, so that I think I can uh, collect the most uh, revenue, right. but I think uh, most of the uh, revenue that go to the, to the central government, but not enough to invest this uh, monthly region to produce and to yes. more services. Mm -hmm. That's why in the later, in the later, and so the, uh, I think you have already so many experience, how to improve the, between the poor and uh, as I said earlier, politics play a hugely important role in this decision. So it is really important for the leadership of the nation to understand that if they nurture the developments and therefore the revenues of the richer provinces, it will help the whole nation. The revenues and development of the richer provinces that will help the whole nation, the whole country. And the other way around, if you squeeze revenues from the richer provinces, they don't have enough resources for in, to invest, and they will slow down. And then the whole nation will slow down. So as Professor Jay Rosengas says this morning, the economic calculation is quite simple. It's much more complicated is the politics. For example, if a province if a central government wants to keep a province or a city in check, it never wants to give that province or city more resources. So that's not economics, that's politics. But that is only the first step. The second step is you need to create the tax sharing system which is transparent and stable. For example, from the perspective of Ho Chi Minh City, I don't see any problems of Ho Chi Minh City will keep like 40% of the total revenue and send 60% to the central government. And if that 40-60% formula is kept stable for some time, it will provide incentive for Chimic City to even increase more revenue because they can keep more. But it will be a problem if Ho Chi Minh City is successful, then it is taxed more. You don't want to increase the tax of successful provinces and cities. To close the loop, you need to look at the other side of the problem as well, which, is, which are the poorer uh, provinces. Central government need to devise the incentives for poorer provinces to collect more taxes to grow up so that it reduces the need for transfer and therefore reduce the tax imposed on richer provinces. One way to do it is to create the performance-based incentive system. You will, the central government will transfer depending on the performance of the province, not like you know, unconditional transfer. So this is a short and quick answer to your very complicated question. So I think time is up, so we need to stop here. But if you have questions, I, I am available outside of the room so that we can discuss more. So thank you very much for your participation and active question and discussion.